please give a warm welcome to Dr. Carrie Dugan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session on thriving in austere environments. My name is Carrie Dugan, and I'm the director for the Biological Technologies Office at DARPA. Today, I'll discuss some of DARPA's current investments in developing technologies that will allow our warfighters to not only survive, but to thrive in austere environments. So one quick note before I get into the overview. Our Q&A feature on the DARPA Forward virtual event platform is live now. Please don't wait until the end of the talk to submit questions. You should feel free to submit your questions and comments as you have them, and I'll address as many as I can at the end of the session. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions, your comments, ideas, suggestions, and other input. So now, without waiting any longer, let's dive in. So part of DARPA's mission is to create revolutionary technologies that support the warfighter whenever and wherever they need to operate. The more austere an environment, oftentimes the bigger the challenge to meet these warfighter needs. So when I say a warfighter needs, a warfighter's needs, what I'm referring to is their essential needs. So food, water, shelter. With these essential needs met, the warfighters can persist and achieve their mission pretty much anywhere. We also need to consider that maybe health is not always a given in these environments, and it may be necessary to meet a warfighter's basic medical needs. Cause, what if a warfighter needs to stop blood loss, prevent disease spread, or delay injury-induced trauma, but they're miles away from the nearest support system? In austere environments, meeting these needs is not always easy. So DARPA is investing in several approaches to improve warfighter access to these four types of needs, food, water, medicine, and shelter. We want to allow our warfighters to bring with them what they must absolutely carry, but also have the opportunity to make what they need, when they need it, and where they need it. So the warfighter can be deployed to all types of environments around the world. And what a warfighter needs to succeed can change with that environment. Some environments are exceedingly remote, driving the warfighter to use what they learn in their survival handbook and training to survive and meet their essential needs so they can complete their mission. Other environments are the epitome of access. As a result of technological developments, most of us are probably accustomed to using the technique of the shopping cart to grab our essential needs. When warfighters have access to large bases, commissaries, and lots of infrastructure, they, like us, will drive to the local store and pick up essentials, or more recently, load them into a virtual shopping cart and have door-to-door -door delivery. So DARPA has honed in on the white space between these two extremes. We want to develop technology to bring the modern convenience of obtaining basic needs to austere environments, but without the infrastructure required to achieve that ideal level of access. We think that the white space between extreme environments and established infrastructure is rich for technological innovation so we can better support the warfighter. So this is a hard problem. The modern way that we meet the basic human needs of food, water, shelter, and medicine is with an incredibly massive and complex supply network that's dependent on physical structures. Oftentimes, we may not even think about everything that goes into filling our shopping carts for our food, it could be a fruit, vegetable, or meat. Chances are it came from a large commercial farm. Whatever the source of food, it has to be grown, harvested, stored, shipped, processed, and displayed, all before it can be put into our shopping cart. Water. Well, it needs to be collected from a source, treated at a water treatment plant, and either packaged into bottles or piped to a faucet. 
and if people get sick. Pharmacies and hospitals offer all sorts of treatments to help them get well. With the modern approach that we're accustomed to, all of these treatments need to be created in highly specialized facilities. But as I said, the warfighter often operates in the unknown without access to these amenities. So I mentioned earlier that what a warfighter needs to succeed could change with their environment. They need to know what threats they may face, how much food or water they're going to need, or what types of medical treatments they're going to need. But what if they don't know all that information? How do you provide everything that's needed to cover all those options without the complex supply networks and infrastructure? And how do you make it all fit into a warfighter's rucksack or at their forward operating base? And so we ask, rather than carrying a superstore's worth of food, water, and medicine, what technological advances are needed so that the warfighter could make those things in austere environments without the massive logistics issues. Beyond food, water, and medicine, infrastructure and shelter are also crucial to how we meet our needs today. The warfighter also relies on established infrastructure. Even in deployed environments, the warfighter relies on shelter, roads, and other built aspects of their forward operating bases for the duration of their mission. But the situation and the environment are not always conducive to conventional construction methods. These methods are high maintenance, they need lots of equipment and materials, not to mention the logistics intensive repair processes. So again, we have that white space that needs to be explored between no infrastructure and a completely built environment. What if we can develop technology to more easily meet the warfighter's infrastructure needs? What would that look like? Okay, so let's get specific about some of these needs and what we think we can do to help. When it comes to obtaining food in austere environments, what does the warfighter have now? Well, for food, the warfighter has MREs. So those are meals ready to eat. So these are calorically dense, pre-packed meals that the warfighter takes with them. Conventional thinking has been focused on things like more efficiently bringing more food with them for the longest amount of time possible. So if they're going for a day, they'll bring one MRE. If they're going for a week, they have to bring at least seven. But it's not always possible to bring all the necessary food Warfighters can only carry so much weight. More food inevitably means less room for other resources. Less water, less ammo, batteries, clothes, you get it. So if warfighters can't bring all their food with them, it makes the operation more complex. They either leave their operating environment to resupply, or more MREs are flown or driven to them. Even at forward operating bases, the warfighter is still dependent on regular supply drops and haphazard supply chains. So, what if MREs run out and no resupply is possible? What technology does the warfighter have when they truly have no food? Well, they eat what they can find. They take guidance from their survival handbook and they survive off the land. For example, Warfighters are taught to hunt for food with a rudimentary slingshot that can be made using common materials. So again, we find ourselves in that white space between survival and the built environment. With all the advances in modern technology and science, we think we can support the warfighter with options other than a DIY slingshot. Okay, what is DARPA doing about this? So we're currently approaching this food problem in two ways. So the first is to create food from otherwise discarded materials, such as plastic. But we all know you can't just eat plastic. What you may not think about is that plastic is actually made up of the same elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, as macronutrients like proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. With plastic, those carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens are trapped in a configuration that is not of nutritional value to humans. 
So we're trying to develop a technology that will break those configurations in plastic so that the base elements can be reformed into macronutrients that are of nutritional value to humans. So I'm going to pause for a second and ask you a question. Have you ever had yogurt, kombucha, kimchi, or a hazy beer? Well, if so, you have consumed tasty microbial biomass that is full of nutritious proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. So we think it will be possible to use enzymatic and chemical processes to convert the polymers and discarded plastics into an organic monomeric microbial feedstock. Right, so bacteria can then use that feedstock from the plastic to grow gain biomass, and serve as the basis for a nutrition source to sustain warfighters. Think about a box where in one end you put in a plastic water bottle, and out the other end you get a protein bar or a protein powder. With this, techno with this technology, sorry, if warfighters have eaten all of their MREs and can't get a resupply, they can repurpose their plastic MRE wrapper and turn it into food. So, what if you have no plastic at all? I'm going to ask you, can we still have delicious, nutritious, bacterial, biomass food? We think you can. And so that introduces our second approach, where we're working to literally pull resources out of thin air. This technology would take the concept of edible biomass one step further and allow warfighters to feed bacteria only water and air. And in turn, the bacteria will produce biomass as food. While this technology is being developed to support the warfighter, we think it could have broader use cases. Could these technologies have the potential to assist in humanitarian relief efforts, providing some support to communities in crisis? Access to food is not a problem limited to the warfighter, and we're excited to see how these technologies could have relevance in crisis situations when food resupply is impossible. All right, water. So, as a general rule, humans can go three weeks without food, but only three days without water. And this guideline illustrates how powerful the need for water is to our survival. So if we know how important water is, what are we doing to ensure our warfighter always has access to it? All right, so we'll go back to the survival manual. And the first recommendation there is to always carry extra water during missions. Subsequently, advancements have focused on how to bring more water with you more efficiently. To achieve that, individual warfighters have moved from carrying bulky old metal canteens to using sleek hydration bladders that have a larger capacity and are easier to carry. Beyond the individual, units use large containers to bring their water with them. Depending on the size of the unit and the duration of the mission, they may need to bring containers that hold thousands of gallons of water and this compounds already burdensome logistics issues. But returning again to that question of when the needed material, in this case, the water you've brought with you, is totally out, what do we have? All right, so the survival manual is going to tell you you need to find a water source. There are a number of ways to try and obtain water. So these range from discovering a natural bed of water, like a stream, or using plant sources, or even just trying to collect the morning dew. But once you have a source of water, you can't just drink it right away. You have to make that water potable. Options include boiling the water, using chemicals to purify it, or using rudimentary filters. But again, we think we can find a solution so the warfighter doesn't have to work so hard to meet their basic needs. So it's been raining a lot here lately, which is unusual. But I think that you know that on a, a damp or muggy day, you can feel the water in the air. 
But even if you can't feel it, water in arid or dry desert air also has water. Air in, sorry, there's also water in dry desert air, even if you can't feel it. So what if we could use the water in the air as a source of drinking water? So we know that dehumidifiers extract moisture from air, and we know that there are other efforts to use that kind of approach to provide drinking water. But dehumidifiers only work well under a small range of temperature and humidity conditions, and we want to be able to reliably extract water from air, even in arid conditions. So recent advances in chemistry have resulted in increased uses of molecules called metal organic frameworks, or MOFs. So MOFs are a class of compounds consisting of metal ions that are coordinated with organic ligands to form one, two, or, or three-dimensional structures. And MOFs are really efficient sorbents. So a sorbent is just a material that is used to absorb liquids or gases. And in this case, certain MOFs are really, really good at absorbing water. So by using these and other novel materials, DARPA researchers are developing technology to, once again, pull the warfighter's basic needs out of thin air and fill that gap between logistically burdensome solutions for water resupply and living off the land. At the individual warfighter level, our technology is being developed to utilize better sorbents to provide the warfighter with enough potable water to sustain them. Think of those hydration bladders. But instead of taking them to a, a water container to refill, they automatically fill themselves by pulling water from the air. And at the established unit level, we want to create devices that will provide enough potable water for up to a company-sized element. Think of like 150 people. So instead of a device that the individual can carry, this device is envisioned to be larger and fit on the back of a truck. So I'll pause here again and let the implications of these kinds of technologies sink in. On-demand production of food and water could have huge implications for warfighters and civilians alike. While the previous solution to this problem was to bring more resources more efficiently, we think the new solution is to make those resources when and where you need them. We know there are still areas to explore. What should we be thinking about beyond on-demand production of food and water? We want your help. We want to think about what future solutions could be for these and other logistics and supply chain challenges. So I'll move into talking about medicine and medical treatments in austere environments. And so we'll think for a second about the kinds of resources that are associated with medical needs. So beyond medications, time, can be one of the most critical resources for our warfighters when they're injured. Here, minutes or hours can prove to be the difference between life and death. At a high level, our military patient flow system can be distilled into the graphic shown here. Essentially, you follow the arrow and the patient is transported to the appropriate level of care for their condition. Each level has its own set of medicines and therapies that it can provide, but it takes time to get between each level. What if the level of treatment a warfighter needs is only available at a Role 4 facility, but they're on the battlefield? So like generating food or water on demand, can we save time by having the medications and treatments that we need at our fingertips? Or can we find other ways to maximize precious minutes? Or perhaps we can find a way to take the, capa the capabilities that exist only in specialized facilities and bring them forward to the warfighter. So I'll talk about a few developing technologies to make and deliver medical treatments where and when we need them. First up, wound healing. So understanding what a wound needs to heal and providing it at the right time is instrumental in proper healing with less scarring. 
So DARPA is researching how to pair cutting-edge sensors with medical materials to enhance wound recovery with a smart bandage. By embedding tiny sensors and medical treatments in material that covers a wound, we can track and respond to the healing wound. The sensors provide real-time status updates, allowing treatment to be adjusted based on the sensor feedback. So this creates a sense and treat feedback loop to accelerate the wound healing process. Second, we'll go to blood. So blood is another critical need on the battlefield. We can need lots and lots of blood for medical treatments, but blood itself is complicated. Right now, we can't make artificial blood, so it has to come from other humans, and that creates complicated logistics for storage and transportation. So DARPA's solution is a blood substitute. So the, the gold standard remains whole blood, but we want to develop an alternative option for emergencies when whole blood is not available. We envision an alternative that contains the necessary medical components to keep patients alive until they can receive whole blood. What if all a medic had to do was add water to a powder and they had a blood substitute right there on the battlefield? We're researching technology to produce a stable, dehydrated powder with a long shelf life that when combined with water will be able to fill the medical requirements of actual blood. So third, I'll come back to the notion of time as a resource. I already mentioned that minutes can make the difference between life and death. That said, a large number of injuries can complicate the medical response. And subsequently, those most in need of care are not always able to be identified and prioritized as effectively as we might wish. Traumatic injuries suffered in diverse civilian and military settings, such as combat, accidents, or mass disasters, may be fatal if not quickly identified and treated. Medical responders use triage procedures to rapidly prioritize casualties for immediate life-saving interventions. But triage is difficult in any circumstance, and complex settings pose significant challenges. So we want to develop technology to help medical personnel make triage decisions. We think that understanding and detecting physiological signatures of injury is part of the answer. In the style of DARPA's previous grand challenges, the DARPA triage challenge will use a challenge format to drive breakthrough innovations so that we can identify these signatures of injury and help medical responders perform scalable, timely, and accurate triage. If you're interested in learning more about the DARPA Triage Challenge and the exciting opportunities associated with the challenge format, there will be a lightning talk later on today with more information. Staying in the context of taking capabilities that require infrastructure and logistics and bringing them to more austere environments, I want to talk about medical treatments that typically occur with more specialized levels of care. Sometimes a warfighter might need to stop an infection or combat other illnesses. And these types of threats to warfighter health can require specific specialized treatments. But if the warfighters don't know what possible threats they'll face in an environment, they would have to bring all the treatment options for everything that they might face. So we already determined that a warfighter cannot reasonably take a superstore's, for, superstore's worth of food and water on their back. Similarly, we can't expect them to carry a pharmacy's worth of medicine in their rucksack. So again, continuing that theme of making things where and when you need them, DARPA is investing in technology to manufacture medical treatments at the point of need. So specifically, DARPA's research efforts include three categories of these treatments. 
the first nucleic acid-based therapeutics, so think about those mRNA vaccines, and protein therapeutics, think about things like antibodies, and pharmaceutical treatments. Here we can think about things like antibiotics. So instead of the current processes with large industrial labs that have huge bioreactors and complicated logistics and supply chains, DARPA wants to develop technology to take the production process and make it expeditionary. We want to provide the capability to generate these treatments where they're needed, when they're needed. What if boxes sitting on the back of a truck could be a mobile pharmacy that provides vaccines, therapeutics, or antibiotics? Think about the outbreaks and medical disasters that could be averted by having specific medical countermeasure production on demand. So, so far, I've talked about food, water, and medicine. And the last area I want to discuss is shelter in the form of expeditionary construction. So, we can't expect our warfighters to live out in the wild, out of their backpacks, forever. Our warfighters will eventually need some sort of long-term structures, whether that's for shelter or simple logistics. Without modern infrastructure, warfighters will attempt to minimally reshape their environment. If they need to make a helicopter landing pad, they'll flatten the earth. While effective, this is not always the perfect solution, and it can lead to conditions called brownout, where so much dust is kicked up from the aircraft landing that the pilots have a hard time seeing. So if you can't tell, that's what's shown here on the left part of the slide. And if you can't see the helicopter through that dust in that picture, imagine how hard it is to land a helicopter in those conditions. So how do we currently support the warfighter? Like for food, water, and medicine, we generally rely on a logistically intensive infrastructure and supply chain. And we have gotten really good at using construction techniques and materials to create the infrastructure our warfighters need. But what if instead we explore that white space between the two extremes? How else could we support the warfighter? Okay, we think it may be possible to reshape the environment more efficiently and with less logistic burden. So we have an effort that is developing technology that when sprayed on sand, gravel, or dirt will harden over a 48-hour period. So this spray is actually a unique blend of microorganisms and growth medium. These naturally occurring microorganisms that are typically found in the ocean are able to take calcium and carbon dioxide from their environment to make and secrete calcium carbonate. This results in tight binding of soil particles together and the production of a hard biological concrete. This technology has been demonstrated to create proof of concept expeditionary landing pads for helicopters without the brownout problem addressed earlier. So in this demonstration video, you can see the standard untreated landing pad on the top compared to the prototype DARPA technology on the bottom. With such incredible results from such a simple process, you can imagine what a huge difference our technology could make for pilots and the warfighters they support. Using biologically grown concrete slabs to make a landing pad could be amazing. But the use cases of this technology even extend beyond that. We asked how else we could harness biology to support expeditionary construction. Our researchers looked at fungi due to their branching network structures called mycelium. So fungi have evolved over millions of years to build these intricate mycelia. You can grow these fungi in a mold where you choose the shape, and they will create tightly woven fibers that fill out the available space. When grown, the mycelium networks are lightweight but extremely strong and have high tensile strength that can resist internal or external pressures. 
researchers were able to shape this mycelium into bricks and create a mortar to bind those bricks together. This allowed them to construct lightweight building structures, such as walls and arches. So what else could the warfighter do with more versatile technologies like these? We envision this technology could help our warfighters to rapidly build shelter, roads, insulation, or even other types of infrastructure they may need. I will wrap up the way I started. So all humans have the same basic needs no matter where they are on the planet. Food, water, medicine, shelter. Unlike most of us, the warfighter must meet their needs as they complete their mission no matter the duration. Often without the infrastructure, many of us take for granted. We want the warfighter to remain focused on their mission and not on where they'll get their food or water from. If the warfighter is injured, we don't want them to worry about whether the medic has the appropriate medical supplies on hand. We want to support them so that they can make or build what they need when they and where they need it. So DARPA performers have made progress in this area so far, but we recognize there are still more opportunities to solve hard problems. We want to hear your thoughts, and we want to work with you. So if I'm not able to address your questions here, or if you want to learn more about how to work with us, please feel free to ask me at one of the breaks.